Hello fellow hackers, I am John Gottfried and this is Bare Metal from Root TV where we talk about real technology with the human beings behind it. Today I'm very excited to have the fashionable and clever James Cropshaw on the program. James is the CTO of New York-based startup Fascism, the maintainer of the open source MongoDB schema analyzer Variety, one of the two-person team who uncovered the first wide-scale breach of the secret ballot in American history. Uh, thank you for coming James, it's uh, great to have you here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to help kick things off. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to just get started by talking about a uh, project you were involved with about six years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, you were on a two-man team that uncovered the first wide-scale breach of the public ballot in American history. You've actually been hacking since a, a very young age. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your beginnings as a sort of hacker? Yeah, sure. And uh, to clarify for any members of the audience who aren't familiar with the vocabulary, it is different than a cracker. Uh, that would be someone who uh, exploits weaknesses in security systems and breaches them illegally. I do not do that. Uh, I was very fortunate in that I had a uh, elementary school where from third grade on, uh, there were uh, mandatory computer programming classes twice a week. Okay. Not just computers, but programming proper. And uh, so we had two computer labs, an Apple lab and a, uh, and a DOS Windows lab. And uh, I changed the uh, startup scripts on the uh, Windows machine so that they all said, uh, Jim was here. Jim referring to me. Okay. And then, and then I told my, my uh, my great instructor, uh, Mark Worthington, and then he told me to, to change it back, and so I said yes, and I did. On a more serious note, wh when you worked on the public ballot project, sort of what was your mission, and how did you go about discovering this wide-scale breach? Was it something that you were tipped off about, or was it kind of just through experimentation that you discovered this? Well, I was working on the project with a, another fellow who is inconveniently named James as well. And uh, he was a uh, poll worker yeah. and a security-minded individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, uh, while working the polls, noticed some potential uh, issues with how uh, uh, voter preference data was being recorded and uh, voter identification data was being recorded in such a way that they might uh, unintentionally be combined to uh, create a correlation between voter identification and voter preference. And so uh, he and I executed uh, some public records requests um, and we uh, were able to uh, do a proof of concept and find that there was, uh, there was a breach. And uh, the breach was wide scale in the sense that there were 10 uh, Ohio counties affected who, which used a uh, specific voting machine. Mm -hmm. And Ohio itself being uh, part of the equation because they had exceptionally liberal public records laws. Yeah. Which we generally view as a good thing. Right. So were these machines designed by a private company? Uh, yes, they were made by ESNS. Okay. Do you think that developers are at fault for creating a voting machine that had this vulnerability? Uh, no, not at all. Um, the vulnerability to be exploited was, uh, was actually quite low tech. Uh, the uh, reason why we were able to execute this proof of concept is just because there was a voter verified paper audit trail mm -hmm. of VVPAT, which we also generally view as a good thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a record of, of voter preference mm -hmm. for individual votes. Uh, and there were timestamps that were down to the second okay. instead of down to the minute like on other machines. So uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't fault uh, the uh, developers or the engineers who built the machine for having a timestamp down to the second. That, the, all of the output of the machine is, uh, in and of itself, innocuous right. as far as uh, establishing the identification of voters goes. Interesting. Do you think that this is something that is just uh, sort of an issue of training? Because, you know, if I went to my father and I said, you know, Dad, you should really encrypt your computer, you should really encrypt your phone, he'd probably think I was crazy, right? Because the public doesn't necessarily have this perception of the insecurity of devices, right? W where do you think that gap is and how can we as you know, hackers kind of 
help to make people more aware of these uh, you know, vulnerabilities and issues? Well, every time that there is a, uh, a big public event where information is uh, found to be tracked by an organization or a government or anything, uh, it uh, chips away at people's confidence in the ability to just have zero concern over the, the safety of their information. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, everyone has a particular tipping point as time goes on. If enough of these breaches occur, then uh, your father as well, for example, will, uh, will think that uh, there needs to be some uh, preliminary steps taken to secure his data. Yeah. Are you referencing any sort of... Uh any, any situation in particular? Well, the most recent situation domestically is uh, PRISM, mm -hmm. the uh, program instituted by the NSA. And uh, regardless of an individual's thoughts on PRISM, what's great about uh, this coming to light is that uh, it shows people simply that there, there, there is uh, a certain need to be concerned about their data. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, uh, the average American individual uh, doesn't need to be concerned about the NSA stealing their data nearly as much as um, uh, potential business competitors, right. identity thieves. Uh, these people, these people uh, are simply far more likely to execute an attack and steal data. Interesting. So do you think uh, that the NSA is technically capable of processing that massive amount of data? I mean, surely, right, companies like Google are dealing with trillions of, you know, bytes, right? They're dealing with uh, zettabytes of data, right? Do you think the NSA is capable of processing the entire backbone of the internet? Or is that kind of the stuff of, you know, like, geek nightmares? <laughs> Well, I, there's a lot of speculation about the NSA, and I, I won't speculate further on it, uh, because uh, speculation is merely that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, if I were involved in a project like that, then it, it would be fairly, I would, I mean, some, uh, some crazy large percentage of uh, internet traffic, for example, I believe is strictly from Netflix. Okay. So... I mean, if there, you know, you could maybe lighten lighten your load twenty percent of the way just by not processing people's Netflix streams and just yeah. and just assume that there's no vulnerable data being transmitted there. It doesn't seem necessary uh, to uh, process all of that data, and Prism doesn't do that, and no other system does that. Uh, intercepting data and processing data are quite different. Yeah, I mean, I, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have a working man's understanding of PRISM. Mm -hmm. That's fine. If I had more, then I would be a dangerous guy. Well, you'd probably be stuck in Russia. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you were working on the, uh, the public ballot project, was this simply a labor of love for you, or is it publicly funded in some way? Well, it was a labor of love, I suppose. There was no funding involved. Uh, the... Uh, the project was designed to make people aware of the situation okay. so that a, uh, a fix could be put in. Mm -hmm. And uh, a fix was put in uh, prior to the next election, thanks to the Ohio Secretary of State. Yeah, I mean, obviously like you have more experience than most with uh, dealing with security, but do you think that kind of these these massive frameworks, like such as Rails, or, or perhaps Django, or something along those lines, do you think that they kind of make developers lazy about security? Because, you know, some would argue that by having so many libraries and so many packages that handle a lot of the sort of core components of your application, that developers no longer need to think about them. And by not thinking about them, newer developers really are not learning them in the first place. You know, there are courses all over the place that teach Rails, but don't teach Ruby. You know, mm. how does that kind of impact like the future of web applications? You know, what should the novice developer be doing to make themselves aware of kind of the the fundamental aspects of you know security and also just uh, you know web application development? Well, as a general rule, uh, it's more secure to use uh, an open source package for something than creating a package yourself, mm -hmm. uh, because the uh, 
uh, amount of stuff that's thrown at uh, the open source package that exists in the ecosystem is going to be much greater. Yeah. Uh, security vulnerabilities are going to be detected more frequently, mm -hmm. which is good. Uh, Rails developers uh, do need to worry about security. Uh, it goes back to what it, it goes back to what I said earlier. Like you know, we don't all. We're, we're, there's 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 not just uh, security superstars and then people who know nothing. Uh, it's 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 a requisite part of a uh, software developer's toolkit. Mm -hmm. So they need they 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 do need to be aware. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, understanding how this relates to your particular application uh, doesn't come from reading things. It comes from uh, a mindset, mm -hmm. and it's all about acquiring a particular mindset. Yeah, uh, and just having that at the very least in the back of your mind while you're working on the software, and then uh, as as the importance of the software grows, the user base grows, then mm -hmm. then uh, continuing to focus on it more. Interesting. So, you mentioned that you've been using Rails since the beta. Do you ever develop on like other frameworks or other languages, or is that kind of your stack of choice? It's the stack of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've done a project here and there in in uh, Java. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oh oh oh, <laughs> Java. Right. Yeah. You know. I don't. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind brackets. It's fine. Uh, I think that there's 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 a real beauty to the Java language. Yeah. yeah I mean, you know. I say that sort of tongue in cheek because you see organizations like Twitter, right, who started on Rails and now are almost completely Java based. I mean, it's Scala, of course, but it is Java based at some level. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's a it's a different language, but it runs on the JVM. Right. Yeah, and um, it's it's certainly somewhat Java esque. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, there's certainly been like this uh, stigma against Java because it was really like. The, you know, the enterprise language, right? right? It wasn't the fun language like Ruby or Node, you know, it was the enterprise language. And it's kind of interesting to see it making a, a resurgence now. You know? Well, Rails, Rails is the uh, easiest way to rapidly create a prototype for a database-backed web application. Yeah. And it's, it's faster to build something uh, in Rails than it is to build it using any Java web framework. Mm -hmm. You've kind of had a number of uh, ventures at this point. You work on a lot of different projects. Um, I've heard through the grapevine that you meet your business partners in kind of an unusual way. Do you, do you have any interesting stories about that? Uh, yeah, it's true. Um, I have... Uh, I don't recall that I've ever gone through uh, a traditional means of doing this. Um, I'm not opposed to it. It just has never... I've just never needed to. It's never worked out in that way. Uh, so uh, I uh, met the uh, um, the CEO and CMO of Fascism uh, because I was uh, I was at a, an after work fashion week party. Okay. And uh, there were these two young women, and they had a, a startup, and they were you know they wanted to take my picture with uh, some outfits on, and and uh, the rest is history. I often uh, meet people just by being very uh, helpful. Simply, uh, if I see that, that uh, someone is um, publicly asking for some kind of advice or some kind of a question on a mailing list or something, then uh, I, I write them and give them a, a, my two cents in a few paragraphs. and. Um, this often uh, translates into a business opportunity. Um, uh, not great if you uh, if you need to make rent in a week. No. Uh, this stuff. I mean, I've I was in a situation. Uh, I was uh, working with a, uh, a talented founder named Rich, mm -hmm. and uh, I met him through uh, the internal GA mailing list. Okay. And uh, there was. Uh, Several months of communication before we uh, we worked together, but we did, and it was uh, incredibly valuable for me and hopefully for him. So uh, yeah, I I, uh, I remember that when I was uh, younger, that I would get uh, I would get gigs uh, working on a contract basis just by finding people on the New York Tech Meetup mailing list who wanted some initial prototype built or something like that, and yeah. I would just email them and try and answer all their questions, and, and I've had success that way, too. How long have you been living in New York now? 
maybe five years, six years, I think, something like that. How did you kind of get you know started in New York Tech? Because really, uh, at least from my perspective, it's grown you know exponentially just in the last like two years. Yeah, right? for better or worse, it's cool now. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, it's no longer. Uh, the weird geeky kids who are working on tech, I guess, but right. like like me, I suppose. Well, they're still here, obviously. Well, obviously, it's um, good. <laughs> but uh, how how did you get your start in New York Tech, and how do you think it's kind of evolved over the time you've uh, been here? Well, so I I uh, had already uh, started a small retail textbook company and uh, co-founded a, an SMS text message venture uh, prior to living here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was, I was already um, fir firmly entrenched in the startup culture mm -hmm. uh, at a time when it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, and, that's, and that's all that I had done and, and still, still now have done uh, as a career by my own choice. Got my first work uh, via this New York Tech mailing list meetup. Now, New York Tech made up uh, probably five years ago was a fraction of the size it was now, right? It was still quite large. Um, I'm, I actually ha I haven't tracked growth over the past five or six years, but I'm, it was quite large at the time. As I believe there's the about thirty or forty thousand members now. Yeah, I think that we were talking uh, four digits at the yeah. time. Yeah. Thanks for coming today, James. It was great talking to you. Thanks and, for uh, having me. Yeah. yeah, I really look forward to seeing. Uh, you know the future of your work on seeds and many other projects so great well thanks much yeah, thank you